I would like to introduce our keynote speaker this morning, Fernando Perez. Uh, he's an assistant professor in statistics at UC Berkeley and also a senior science fellow and founding co-investigator of BIDS, the Berkeley Institute for Data Science. Um, in 2012, he received an award for the advancement of free software from the Free Software Foundation. And he created IPython in 2001 when he was just a grad student and then co-founded Project Jupiter, the successor to IPython in 2014. And as I'm sure you all know, they, uh, Jupiter has taken the whole world of, of uh, open science by storm. Uh, Jupiter notebooks are used by a huge range of scientists and even non-scientists. And there are well over two million Jupiter notebooks on GitHub. Uh, so in just uh, last month, the Project Jupiter was honored with the ACM System Software Award. So it's my pleasure to present Fernando. Thank you, Nomi, for the kind introduction. Um, I want to start by thanking the conference organizers and all of you uh, for inviting me and all of you for taking the time to, um, to attend this, uh, this session. I, I want to talk a little bit about sort of some of, some of the lessons that I've learned uh, around, uh, around uh, uh, open source, but uh, from the perspective of Jupiter, so I also want to talk a little bit about new things that, that we've been doing in the project, uh, some of which you may uh, uh, not be aware, um, uh, aware of yet. So, but to, to frame it first, uh, to frame the problem first, I'd like to, I'd like to sort of present why, why I got involved uh, in building open tools for, scient uh, for scientific research uh, from, from a few different angles that to me are all, uh, are all actually important. And they, have, they play different roles, but they, they, uh, they sort of define, define for me uh, why I do these kinds of things. One is an, one is an ethical uh, standpoint, uh, and which is that I, I think openness, uh, I view openness in, in this context um, as a proxy for fairness. If, if things are open, it is easier to be f to provide fair um, uh, to provide fair access uh, to uh, to others uh, connected to the fruits of our labor uh, than uh, than if tool if if the tools we use uh, in the instruments of our research are gated uh, by legal and financial barriers. Um, the next one is a human and social one, which is that openness fosters collaboration, uh, and I think we are well past. Uh, the point, uh, we all, probably everyone in this room uh, knows that, but we're well past the point uh, where science is done by, by single lone individuals. Um, today, uh, all of the challenges that we have are, are large-scale team challenges that require multiple perspectives, uh, and, uh, and this is, the, uh, only in an open context can we do that, uh, I believe, really effectively. Um, there is uh, an epistemological perspective that I, I think uh, I don't need to defend in this room, which is that, <laughs> That proprietary science is an oxymoron. I mean, um, I we all we all want our science to be accessible and reproducible for us to to be able to inspect uh, the the quality of the work of others uh, and the assumptions they use uh, and how they reach their conclusions. And finally, I started this in, in Python because I just enjoyed uh, I enjoy the language. After having used other tools, I just found it to be a to be a, a fun tool to, a fun tool to use. Um, Python was developed initially uh, by Guido van Rossum uh, back when he was in, uh, at a research center in the Netherlands, and he picked up lessons from another research project from that, uh, uh, that center called ABC. Um, and ABC was a language designed for teaching programming. It was a research project in, in, in teaching programming, but it's interesting that, that this, is, this is the lesson that, that Guido drew from, from his experiences uh, uh, with uh, uh, with the development of the ABC project in that lab. And for me, the work of Guido and the work of the Python community has been a very important guiding light, if you will, because the way they manage that community, the way that they interact at multiple levels has informed a lot of the work that I do. And uh, there's another very interesting idea from Guido that I, for me resonates extremely, um, extremely well, which is this notion that programming languages are fundamentally about communication between humans, uh, right? And, and that's because what we do in IPython and Jupyter precisely plays off of these ideas very strongly. Um, we, regardless of how much the internet advances, regardless of how many data, center, Google, data centers Google or Amazon open, we are still bounded by the bag of meat in our heads, right? Our brains aren't getting any bigger. In fact, they're getting slower. At least mine is getting a lot slower <laughs> at, a, at, a, at a frightening, at an alarming rate. Um, and whether the computers we use are the laptops that you have, uh, that, that you have today or large-scale supercomputers or data centers, um, 
what we try to do with IPython and Jupyter is basically build a bridge between those two worlds, build tools that help you have a dialogue with the computer to reason about problems and to have dialogues with each other. And so it's both tools for computation but for, and for human collaboration. And we think of both as sort of co-partners in a conversation about, uh, about, uh, about data. And, uh, and it all began, as, no, as Nomi mentioned, uh, as a very simple uh, 260 lines Python uh, script back when I was in grad school, um, which was originally grounded around the workflow of running code at a terminal. But from the beginning, the idea was to have tools to run an exploratory workflow, right? It was from the very beginning, IPython was basically trying to improve the interactive Python um, experience for the purposes of a scientist who was trying to understand their data rather than for the, for the, in the context of, say, a professional software engineer who has a well-defined problem spec and is building a library, is building a large software system, is, is building a tool. This was very much like, you run my code, look at my data. By looking at it, I think about something, then I run a little bit more code, and I iterate. This is a workflow that I'm sure is familiar to all of you in some variation of it, regardless of what programming language or tool you use. Uh, I want to emphasize that this is a team project, and everything I will say, the credit goes to these people and many, many more. This is a picture from our most recent sort of all-hands meeting uh, in Berkeley a few weeks ago. There are people there from industry. There are people from national laboratories. There are people from academia. There are contributors from the community. It's a very interesting mix of folks who come from very different perspectives and very different angles to the project. Um, and that, that is what makes it a success, and they are the ones who deserve the credit. Um, who here has never used uh, an IPython Jupyter Notebook uh, before? So for those of you who haven't used it, uh, uh, a quick, um, a quick uh, uh, sketch of the idea is to have an environment where you build a document which is the combination of text, natural language, let's say, uh, text and, and math, including mathematical notation, code, and the output of the code. And all of those are woven into a single document. Um, so you can think of it as basically Google Docs with a brain. Google, it's a web-based um, uh, interactive editor, but where you actually can execute code. Uh, and anything that you can display uh, in a web browser, pretty much you can do in a, in a Jupyter Notebook. So whatever output formats, audio, video, multimedia, interactive JavaScript that are supported by, uh, by the web, you can put in a notebook. Uh, it's based... The idea um, is uh, behind Jupyter, and this, this evolved over time gradually, uh, but was to capture that original experience of typing at the interactive terminal, what is known in computer jargon as the REPL, the read eval print loop, and basically soup it up for the age of the web and encode it, codify it into a formalized protocol that, is actually, that actually has documentation and that has a, a very concrete specification of what can go in, what can go out. And, and so the idea was let's turn that process of humans doing interactive work into a standard specification um, that can represent outputs such as text, which obviously is what you, you assume out of basic terminal, that's what comes out, but also images, mathematical uh, objects, are first class citizens uh, in, uh, in the specification. Um, any, as I said, anything the web can represent, so HTML and JavaScript and even interactive interactive control. So this is an example of typing a small amount of code, uh, just the one, basically a one line decorator that will turn this function into an interactive widget, which as you slide it, it re-executes the code. The idea being that sometimes you want to do a little bit of interactive exploration without writing a full-blown graphical user interface, which is a lot of work and which is typically not part of your job as a researcher. But these things are actually encoded in a protocol. They're actually encoded in a formal messaging specification. If anybody's interested in the details of that, which I won't get into here, I'm happy to talk about them offline. And the value of doing that, the value of taking these very basic ideas that are decades old and turn them into a formalized protocol that is well-defined, that is well-specified, that is open to all, that is based on, on standards such as JSON um, and open source libraries, meant that we could use it for what used to be called IPython, but it could be used to build a similar interactive environment in a different programming language, say Julia, or R, or many, many, many more. And so this is how IPython became Jupyter, basically, as we generalized the original ideas of running interactive code in Python to make it uh, an open standard. It was adopted by the community. People, we actually worked only on a couple of those backends, the one for Julia and the one for R, and then the community built backends, and today there's about 100 different programming languages supported by it, which means that you can have one of these systems, whether it's the notebook or actually other tools that we have, but where the execution context is provided by 
a different programming language. And so this is an example of a C++ notebook. So literally, you are running live live interactive C++. Um, and this is being developed by, by former Bloomberg employees who now uh, run a company in France called Quantstack that builds tools for, fin uh, for finance. And it's basically high performance interactive C++ for numerical computing and financial modeling. And this was a, a tweet from one, uh, one, actually a person who works in Jupyter, uh, having discovered there was a Spark QL uh, kernel implemented for it, which, uh, and with which he could go and play with the open data that Wikipedia provides on the Wikidata project uh, to do queries. So this, this goes, the, the point that I'm trying to make here is that yes, it took us extra time to come up with the clean abstractions that encoded the patterns we were using internally in IPython, but that effort paid off handsomely because now there are now what we have is a layer of tools that benefits multiple communities regardless of the tools that they use and we can all cooperate and, and collaborate as humans on the layer of, of the interactive tools. Um, this development uh, is called, in fact, if you, if you haven't installed on your laptops, you probably type Jupyter Notebook. Um, but the, no the name Notebook is actually a little bit of a misnomer because that application has has to have a file manager so that you know where you are. We eventually added a terminal emulator to it because it's very handy when you're on a remote server. Sometimes you, you do need to do stuff at the command line. Um, we added a text editor because we needed one. Sometimes you want to, it's especially handy when teaching. Um, if students are on a remotely hosted system uh, with introductory courses, not to drop them into a, a VI or Emacs on a remote Unix host, but to actually give them a normal text, uh, a graphical text editor. But obviously these things are not a notebook anymore, right? It, it actually is a more complex application for scientific workflows. So we have built over the last few years in, in close partnership with, with a team at Bloomberg and uh, also engineers at Anaconda, a tool called Jupyter Lab, which is basically collecting the lessons from all of this and turning them into, uh, into one tool that I'm going to show you uh, live. So this is never a good idea, but we're gonna, we're gonna, see, how, uh, we're gonna see how it goes. So this is what Jupyter Lab. This is what Jupyter Lab looks like today. You can you can pip install it. It's in open beta um, or install it uh, in Anaconda. And so it is a, it, it, is, it still uses the same pattern of being accessed through the browser, uh, which is a decision we made early on that um, has obviously a few drawbacks in that some of the user experience is slightly less native, but it has huge benefits. It, it, it has had huge benefits for us in that it allows us to deploy exactly the same system on a laptop, on a remotely hosted, hosted environment, and everything is 100% the same. Um, in in Jupyter Lab, well, you, this is the the launch interface that you have now. If you say I want to open a new notebook, um, it's the same as before. You can type code and it executes. So this is this is um, this is all the same. Um, I can open a notebook here. Um, I can collapse this. I can keep my two notebooks open at the same time. Um, this is an example. Of, uh, of a notebook that has, for those of you who haven't seen how it works, you have uh, text here, uh, and it's actually marked down where you can also type LaTeX into it, and then as you exit it, it gets rendered. Um, and this is, uh, this is the, the kind of code that gives you an interactive control. In this case, we're calling um, an, ordinary, or an ordinary differential equation solver for the classic Lorentz equations, and by, uh, by calling the interactive version of it, then we, sent, we get sliders that as we as we move them, call the code again and give us interactive exploration of the parameters without having to write a full-blown, as I said, a full-blown graphical interface. Um, but then I can say, okay, I actually want to keep this uh, output in here so that as I move the parameters, as I move, as I move these parameters, uh, I see what's going on. And you see that these are linked. So now we're beginning to see the advantages of this architecture. What we've done is we went back. Jupyter Lab is not simply the same four tools that we had before put together in a different in a different window pane. What we did was all of the underlying data communication, all of the underlying information flow was baked into the application. And Jupyter Lab is assembled as a tool that implements the Jupyter protocols and lets any two components communicate using them so that you can have a notebook, but you can keep working in here and you can keep, say, exploring the parameters of your data from this single object. So now what used to be just a document is now a source of computation and information for other things. In addition, um, in addition to notebooks, 
it turns out that in this world we have data. And so you may have a very big CSV file. Um, this is a data set that some of you may have played with. Um, it's the New York City uh, taxi data set. So that was, do not try this in Excel. Because I just scrolled basically at 60 frames per second on a 1.2 million row CSV file. Uh, and so we've begun to basically bake, bake very high performance tools into the system to access, to access large scale data, data sets in, in a convenient manner. Um, and when you open a CSV, this is what you see. This is the classic iris. This is what CSVs look like by default, right? And so the machinery in Jupyter Lab lets you view data in different ways. And so, for example, it's not just looking at the raw data. It's saying, what is the structure of that data? If it's a CSV, we will try to show it to you in a tabular format. Um, let's open this file. This is a JSON file that as JSON tends to look, it's not the most friendly thing to read directly, but if you look, uh, if you look a little bit closely, you will see that it looks like there's coordinate, uh, coordinates in there. In fact, this is a GeoJSON file, so it's JSON encoded according to a specific schema for geospatial data. If I install the GeoJSON uh, plugin, then it knows how to render these data, so that when you click on it, you actually get those those entries in the JSON file are actually uh, coordinates, uh, in this case of museums in, uh, of museums in Washington, D.C., uh, and it, it will open the data file on top, on top, of, a, on top of a proper uh, OpenStreetMaps layer uh, with, those coordinates, uh, with those coordinates. So given that you are all bioinformaticians, you will recognize a FASTA file as a bunch of A's, C's, and T's, um, but it was very easy to wrap a uh, an assembly viewer so that uh, so and th it's possible that someone in this room wrote this tool uh, I don't know I'm sure many of you have used it um, but uh, but it was it, it was very easy for us to wrap uh, the 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 tool to view to view FASTA files into a little widget that that would display that that would display them within Jupyter Lab and the point is now you have a data viewer but these data viewers because they're part of the same architecture. Now I can use them as code. So we, once we've defined the, the, the little bit of JavaScript that basically tells the architecture how to grab that output, then I can say, show this in IPython, and effectively this is all the code I have to write. And then once I have written this code, I can use that same exact data viewing tool as a, as a function call. So the, the whole idea behind this is to, to define these components so that they can be used as standalone uh, gra uh, graphical elements in a, in a GUI-based workflow or programmatically in a code-oriented workflow without ever rewriting anything. So they should be the exact same components that you use back and forth um, in both contexts. But in, uh, in, the context of, in the context of scientific research, we often also need to use the, uh, things that are not notebooks, but that are regular documents. So yes, we have a text editor like we did before, but now let's say we, I want to open this markdown file. I can open a markdown file, and now I have a, a markdown editor with live, uh, with live markdown preview, so that if you're writing an R markdown or LaTeX or something like that, you can have um, you can have live preview, but because we are a computational environment, we can say, wait a minute, I actually want to have code attached to this document. So I've created what's called a console. A console is not a notebook. A console is a graphical tool that works in the same environment, but has the append workflow of a terminal. But it's, it's like a terminal, but it's within this graphical context. So all of the graphical things that happen in, um, in this environment still work. And I can say, now in my document, I can run a little bit of code. And if I say A is equal to 100, I can run it again. So the document editor is now connected to the computational engine so that if you're writing, say, a paper that has a bunch of code, as you write your code, as you write your paper, you can, you can still can still have computation connected, um, connected to your document. So this is, 
this is beginning to show the value of decomposing all of the things that were very monolithic in the original architecture right, into pieces that can now be reused. These are all actual little, little plugins that you, that, you can, that you can use. And in fact, some of them ship by default. Some of them are, are third-party plugins. The GeoJSON one is a plugin that I had to install. Um, the Markdown Viewer, that's built into the system because that seems to be a very, uh, a very a common enough need that we built it in. The CSV Viewer is built in, but the, the FASTA one is not because bioinformatics is a domain-specific application. CSV, we deemed generic enough that it was worth kind of shipping it, shipping it in by default. And An important point of this is that this architecture, changing the resolution made it a little bit funky, this architecture has now been used By, many other, by other people to build new tools. So this is an example of something called scripted forms written by a third party member of the community. What he did was he wrote a tool that allows, him, that allows you to write markdown files. So this is now Visual Studio Code, a normal text editor. I have a markdown file annotated with the special syntax that he made. And as I, um, in the syntax I can put, uh, I can, I can put code blocks, but I can run his tool and it will load this markdown file as a standalone user interface where you don't have to load any of the JupyterLab interface. And now it's calling the code. It's the code that is being called is dot lower. Now, let me move this over here. I change the code to upper the moment I save. The moment I save in the, in the text editor, the live view response. So what he did was he built a React-based user interface that allows you to effectively write, write GUIs by simply writing a markdown file and your users don't need to see anything else. Everything in here is actually JupyterLab under the hood. In fact, I can open that file here and here is the live version I was just showing you. And so, there you see. So it, he built it as a JupyterLab component, but it is usable completely outside if the deployment context that you need is a different one. And so again, I'm trying to sort of show the value of building these pieces in a decomposable way. This person literally showed up one day with a tool fully built on the mailing list saying, hey, thank you folks. It was so nice that you make this thing kind of nice and clean because this is what I built. This is what I needed for my problem. And when we looked under the hood, like it's basically all of the JupyterLab machinery without any of the UI. The UI that we built was driven by some of the use cases that we know are useful, but we don't have all the use cases. He had a valid use case that was different and this enabled him to build the tool that he needed. So, okay, we survived that. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a flavor of what, of, of what the, the architecture of JupyterLab does. This is effectively where we are going. So obviously there's gonna be a transition period. For anyone who's curious, no, we're not changing the notebook format. The, the notebook files are the same uh, at heart. So everything you've been doing in the notebook uh, with normal notebooks works the same. Some of the, if you have been using extensions, yes, extensions do need to be ported and we're working with the community and helping people port the most important extensions. But we do think it's a much more flexible and vers versatile architecture. Another piece of the project um, that helps us grow the community is to go from one laptop to larger systems. Um, and that is provided by a tool called Jupyter Hub. And back to this idea of making things decomposable and reassemblable, Jupyter Hub is not part of the Jupyter Notebook. It is a separate application that will run your Jupyter Notebook. The Jupyter Notebook app is designed as a single user application with no concept of users or authentication or anything like that. And you embed that into the Jupyter Hub machinery that gives you support for deploying in an organization. So the idea is that Jupyter Hub manages authentication of your users, and then it will deploy your coding environment. By default, it's a Jupyter Notebook, but you can actually do other things. So for example, at Berkeley, uh, in the stats department, we ran out, now, we now run a Jupyter Hub deployment that has both Jupyter and our studio available within it. Um, so that for, with a single sign-on, you can access both of them, because even though Jupyter does have our support natively, some people do want to work in our studio, and that's fine. 
So, but what this means is that we can go from single laptops and, 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 and all of the problems that entails with deployment and whatnot to shared hardware infrastructure, to shared data storage for big data sets, to shared environments for doing work, uh, work in teams um, and workflows so that you can, uh, whoa, what happened? Uh, yes, so you can run this on big fancy hardware. So that picture that I showed earlier, that's actually Cori. It, when it came out, it was, I think, the, the number five super, supercomputer in the world. It's just above, the, uh, uh, above the, the Berkeley campus at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Um, and so you can run that same machinery either uh, on, on, that, uh, on that class of hardware or from content uh, uh, available on the web. And using this kind of hardware leads to Opens, opens interesting possibilities. So this is some work that we've been doing, uh, we've been doing uh, just recently. Actually, this is these slides, the credit goes to the LBL team, uh, are part of a, a tutorial that is being given tomorrow at a supercomputing conference uh, about how to do interactive, basically laptop style work on the largest machines in the world. And so how do you use, um, basically how to turn, a, how to turn a, a 10 or 20 million supercomputer into a laptop. That's kind of, that's kind of the, the, the goal of this, and, and for good reasons, because we all want to, we, we basically want to move seamlessly from working on a laptop to having larger, larger resources and access to more machines. Cray, as I said, is a, uh, is a big machine. The NERSC team has worked on making Jupyter available uh, on, on, on Cori, so that, so they run a Jupyter Hub uh, server uh, connected to the login nodes, and the architecture of these big machines typically is separated between login nodes that feel like more like normal, normal computers, and then the, the rest of the machine is, is gated off into compute nodes that are often very, very, very minimalistic and have very limited flexibility in what they can do, and they often don't even have external network access, but they're optimized basically for raw, absolutely raw performance on very large-scale codes. Cori is an interesting machine that can be reconfigured. Uh, they, they have what's called a software-defined network, which means that they can actually, recon the hardware supports virtual networking that allows the remote machines to connect to the interactive environment. And so using a tool called, that's part of the IPython stack called IPy Parallel, uh, that, has, uh, that is deployed here, you basically instantiate a bunch of nodes, which themselves are connected via MPI, and obviously on this, class of hardware, MPI, is, MPI has been optimized to death to run, it, to run internode communication very, very fast. Um, and so one of, the, one of the projects that we've been working on over the, last, uh, over the last year is in collaboration with some particle physicists doing interactive machine learning um, training runs on particle physics data sets. And that's a process which is very well suited for this because on the one hand, it's extremely compute intensive, so you want to run it on, on, on big iron. On the other hand, even though, yes, you can define loss functions and metrics to optimize over, um, you, there's so many knobs to turn, there are so many hyperparameters to search over um, that human input is still useful. You still want to know what is happening. You still want to see what's going on. And so what, what happens is, as you, this is a, a, a screenshot of a notebook where you begin, on different, you begin uh, multiple runs that are updated in real time interactively and as you look at the, the data that is coming out of them, you can go back and effectively say, this particular run is going in the wrong direction. It's not worth using $10,000 of my allocation looking in that direction. This one looks promising. Let's zoom into here. Here we need to search a little bit more. So it is the combination of doing things on a, on a very large scale with having still that let me think about what I'm doing at the terminal that we had, um, that we had originally. Um, and as an outgrowth of all of this, we just started a few weeks ago a new mailing list called Jupiter at Research Facilities. This, this is a pattern that we see emerging with places that have big instruments, whether it's a telescope, it's a light source, it's a free electron laser, it's a genomics facility, some, some typically large physical thing that produces a lot of data that is relevant to a domain, an electron microscope, something, and that has both the need for a lot of interactive analysis of that data and a lot of compute attached to it. And this pattern is appearing in many, many places in the world uh, and in multiple scientific disciplines. And so the people who are having these needs are finding the deployment of tools like Jupyter extremely useful uh, for their users and, uh, and, and, uh, and for their research needs. So we started uh, this, it's kind of a nascent community, but I'm hoping that, that people who have these kinds of needs will actually come and collaborate and partner up in deploying it in their own context and building, uh, building, uh, building new, um, building new things. Now, as we 
we're, I was talking about using, using this machinery to access large resources. We can also use it to access uh, code and, uh, and data that is on the web on a place like GitHub. And once you have all of this, once you have the code, a way to deploy it, the interface, and access to, say, the, the repositories that contain the code, if you do a little bit more work, you can package it all in a nice and convenient kind of to-go box. And so the idea for this uh, uh, project that became named Binder, it was, uh, it was kicked off at a meeting that, I, uh, that, uh, that uh, Jeremy Freeman and I had actually when he visited the Kbase project when I was working on Kbase. Um, and Jeremy then went over to his lab. He's now at the Chen Zuckerberg Initiative, but he used to be at Janelia Farm. Um, and he built a prototype uh, of what he called Binder, which I think is a brilliant name. Um, and it's a project that tries to do the following. You give it a repository, a source of code, where you did follow some best practices. So you did follow the practice of explicitly indicating what dependencies that code has and providing them in a machine-readable fashion. And then if you provide simply that URL, you say, this is my repo and I'm following your, your pattern, then Binder will grab, grab the code, grab the dependencies, package them into a Docker container, ship, ship it off onto a Kubernetes cluster, and give you back a URL that is an executable version of that thing. So it basically makes it instantly possible to share a complete end-to-end -end research workflow by providing someone a link that allows them to log in and execute the code. This project is now uh, the, the Jupyter Hub team then has pick, picked up Jeremy's original prototype and has built something called Binder Hub that basically allows you to package the whole thing on top of the Jupyter Hub architecture to provide deployable collaborative environments uh, for reproducible research. This is the usage of Binder has been growing rapidly. Originally, Jeremy literally out of his grant, out of his pocket, out of his kind of discretionary funds that Janelia Farm used it, uh, was paying for it. Now with the new architecture, and seeing on the order of 3,000, and probably more than that because these, uh, these, uh, these data are a little bit old, uh, users per week. Uh, and right now we have funding from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation to run this prototype for about a year. And it looks, it looks promising enough that hopefully we'll be able to find sustained funding to build this into something that can actually be used also to change the culture of scientific publishing because that's ultimately the idea is to make research uh, sharing uh, um, easier following this quote that I've used many times in my talks that uh, some of you have probably seen, all, it's widely used by a lot of people who care about reproducible research, and it's an old quote from David Donahoe, um, channeling uh, John Clairbaut from Stanford. Um, but this quote about reproducible research is from 1995. Uh, and for a long time I've heard people present these ideas, uh, and I think we finally are at the point where we can provide the tools to make this sort of a, a one-click reality for, for working scientists who do want to focus on their science and not on building engineering uh, layers uh, all day long. And so by virtue of having these tools now, it is becoming possible to teach the next generation these ideas. So I want to talk a little bit about that. So in, uh, in the fall of 2017, I taught a course called Collaborative and Reproducible Data Science at UC Berkeley. This was my GSI who did a phenomenal, uh, a phenomenal job. And this was a course intended to basically take all these ideas and turn them into everyday practice. Going back to um, Tracy's comments yesterday about uh, some of these papers that are starting to come out that provide sort of templates and, and checklists for how to do things, we, we kind of tried to turn this process of doing research in a more reproducible manner into something that could become an everyday habit. Um, the idea was, first of all, to define some of the ideas about uh, around uh, sound practices and reproducible research to motivate the why, why this is important for students. This, is a, this was an undergraduate course with majors from, uh, with students from multiple majors. So we wanted to frame the problem for them uh, from, from different perspectives. And finally, to teach them how to do it, not as something that is some big aspiration that one day when you grow up you will get to do, but something that just becomes a natural everyday practice rooted around a bunch of skills. So this was teaching them about Git and GitHub as everyday tools. In this case, we did it in Python. You could do it with other languages. Process automation as a natural thing that you do all the time with Make. You obviously using the data analysis stack, documenting your work with Sphinx, um, testing everything you do. In this case, we're using PyTest. Bringing continuous integration to your everyday workflow. And finally, packaging your work in a reproducible manner using, uh, using, the, using the, uh, the, the binder tools. And so 
the idea w was to, the analogy that I like to use is brushing your teeth. It's a lot, it's a lot uh, less painful than a root canal. And making, uh, making your paper uh, reproducible at, at publication time is the root canal of science, right? Because by that point, you are probably in for a huge amount of pain if you need to go back and clean up years of work. But if you do it on an everyday basis, if, you do, if, you, if you've built your work in this fashion along the way, it actually should take no more work than clicking the, the, the binder link and, and sending it, um, sending it to, uh, to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to the journal or the conference or wherever you're submitting your work. And so we, what we did was basically teach them Git from the start and use it for everything. So we were using Git, GitHub Classroom, which is not a super fancy tool. It's fairly primitive, but it gets the job done of managing homeworks and grading and submission through Git so that this would be something that literally they could not do without. And we started, uh, uh, this is a, a dare from, from Tracy yesterday, that yes, we do actually teach them the ideas behind Git because I am convinced that you can actually do much better with Git if you understand how it works. And we do mention the word DAG, but it's a note. It's a note. It's not, we don't turn them into computer scientists. Uh, we actually talk about bubbles and arrows. And the idea is to actually implement Git in the first two cells. These are the first two cells of the tutorial as a notebook. And that's basically a complete implementation of Git. I call it Pico Git, and it's, it's real code in Python. And it implements the idea that Git is nothing but a chain of things where the first node in the chain is uh, something that computes a hash of your data, whatever your data is, and some metadata, let's say the date. And you compute the hash of that, and you have a label for that thing. And then after that, the next thing, you repeat the same process. You have more data. It's a little bit later. But now, you compute the new hash on the new data plus the hash of the previous one. And that's it. And once they understand that there's this l chain of bubbles connected by these arrows and that they can't be broken, then everything else in the Git workflow comes into place. Branches or labels on these things. They're basically alphanumeric labels. And doing rebases is moving one of these, bub one of these arrows over and recomputing these chains. The cryptographic integrity of the entire repo. All of it falls out from understanding a basic idea that you can explain with nine lines of Python and bubbles and arrows. And so, yes, Tracy, <laughs> we do it, and it's fun. Um, and we do use Tracy's tools, or Tracy and their team, and the Carpentry's teams. Um, their make tutorial is absolutely brilliant. And so when I wanted to teach that, I didn't go and reinvent. I talked to Tracy and some of her colleagues, like Katie Hoff at the Carpentries. They said, no, we have a tutorial. We have shareable, accessible materials that have been battle tested that come actually with, with, a, with pretty much a timer on how much time you should spend on every section. And so to teach them the notion that they should automate and test their code, we use their materials. And it worked absolutely, absolutely brilliantly. I'm skipping over quite a bit because what I want to get to is that at the end of the course, we tried to have the students do a little, quote, research project, which was just pick a, pick a data set and do some, some new analysis that you want to do on it, kind of mimicking the process of, of real scientific research, obviously, in, in a toy problem in a couple of weeks, but still, as a team with a new data set without a predefined analysis rubric. And the point was to give them this template of if you provide a repo that, have, that follows these practices and that has the data either included or linked if it's too large. If your code has tests um, and documentation, if all of the analysis notebooks and supporting code are included in the repo so that I can recreate every figure. If the main narrative, if sort of the paper, is actually a separate notebook that doesn't have computation, and it could be a LaTeX file, it could be an R markdown file, it doesn't matter, but that now weaves the questions and the story and the results into a single thing. If all of that is driven by a proper make file that executes all the code and has the data dependencies between the stages of the analysis and has an environment YAML file that describes, uh, that describes the dependencies so that we can package it as a binder, and if you follow good practices such as having a proper readme, licensing uh, conditions for your code, et cetera, um, then what we have is a little standard playbook that the students can follow, at least for the basics of sort of proper end-to-end -end hygiene. It's not the only answer to this problem. You can do other things. They can iterate after that. But at least there's a process to start from. And this is back to Tracy's idea about the value of having these somewhat, somewhat well-organized 
um, checklists and, 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 and good practices uh, lists. And this is an example of what one of the students turned, or one of the student teams turned in. They, had, uh, they, they did some analysis on relationship between study time and sleep time and, 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 and school performance. And they, their readme described everything that they did. Um, there was actually, their build was passing. So this is a link to their continuous integration. Uh, Travis deployment, there was a link to the binder if you wanted to launch it. Here was the repo and they provided supporting analysis notebook, separate code files with separate standalone unit tests. So the idea being you have both library code and interactive analysis. Um, and, and, the, uh, and the final main narrative that, that sort of summarized the, uh, the entire project. So they did it and it worked and the, the feedback was fantastic from the students. Some of them ended up starting to contribute to Pandas and becoming new open source contributors. So one of them uh, actually wanted to turn that into an undergraduate research thesis. Um, for me, one of the most satisfying was a, a student who came, she came from a journalism background and she got so excited with all of this that she decided to apply to grad school in data science and uh, I wrote her some letters of recommendation. She got accepted at Johns Hopkins, at Columbia, at NYU. She eventually uh, decided to go to Columbia. Uh, and, uh, and this was fantastic because she said, I, I didn't think I could do any of this. Uh, I'm a journalist, but this was after learning that I could do this in a systematic way. I'm, I'm willing, and she ended up at one of the top schools in the, um, in the world in this. So it was very satisfying. Um, I think it's clear by now that the world wants open tools. I think many of us have been fighting these battles for 10, 20 years. I think it's clear now that this is what people really want. This is data updated a few days ago. Right now we're at, at about 2.4 million notebooks on GitHub and it keeps going up. Um, this is a, I didn't make this plot, but uh, right, uh, it, was, uh, it was somebody posted on Twitter. Um, these are the search the Google Trends uh, for a uh, well-known proprietary system and for some of the open systems that, uh, that we're building. And, uh, and it's interesting to see that finally the proprietary walls are beginning to crack and that makes me very, very, very happy. Um, in the last few minutes, I want to talk a little bit about where we're headed next. About, and this is a long quote that uh, you can read later. Um, it's a very critical quote from Jaron Lanier and it's aimed at the Silicon Valley and tech world. And I don't mean to be as harsh as he is about that world, about the open source uh, community, but I do think there's a message in here that we need to listen to, which is that we, we tend to think of ourselves because we're still struggling, we're looking for grants, we're looking for funding, we're looking for career paths, but we also have to recognize that now we are somewhat grown up. We do have resources, we do have some tools. And so with some success comes responsibility. Um, we have to be better at our community building. We have to be much more deliberate and much more systematic at taking these challenges seriously. Um, I mean, obviously he's railing about Facebook and Twitter and, 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 and Google and all that, but I do think the nugget, that nugget of if you, were, if you felt that you were the young rebel once and your act of rebellion because it was morally justified could justify all other things, well, for us, it's kind of time to outgrow that mindset. Um, and, but I also want to use this to push back on the people he was pushing, which are, and I'm very grateful for the industrial support that we get and we get it and that this conference gets, but our industry partners have a responsibility. Uh, those who have contributed to this conference are contributing, but not all industry is contributing. There is, there is a lot of industry that has a purely extractive uh, mindset uh, with, in its relationship with, with the open source world. It mines extractively the technology itself, which is obviously free and open. It mines the people who get trained for free. It's not free, by the way. It's just that they're not paying for it. Uh, they're, letting, they're letting kind of the Darwinian process uh, play itself out on GitHub and they pick up, they pick up from the top. Uh, and the, the projects and the people suffer. The projects suffer because they, they, they pluck typically the best fruit out when it's nice and ripe and don't contribute anything back. And so, and, and we've seen projects suffer dramatically when key people are lost in this way. And, but there's another element, which is that that practice is extremely toxic to building a more inclusive community because who can afford to work for free? Well, you can afford to work for free if you don't have to have a second job, if you have someone who takes care of your family, blah, 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 blah. So they are, it's no wonder that they keep having diversity problems. It's no wonder that they, well, look at where they're fishing, right? They are fishing exactly into a system which is fed by mechanisms that amplify that problem. So we, we do need, we need to do better, but we also need to push on, um, on them um, because I think there are, they do have responsibilities. And all of this, 
at this point, this slide is mostly asking questions. This is a, a really tough set of intersecting uh, tensions that for which I don't have any good answers. I do have a lot of questions um, because yes, we're successful. And by, when I use we here, I'm deliberately being ambiguous about is it we Jupiter? Is it we all the people who build open tools? It's, it's all of that in some fashion. Um, but uh, our, we all worry about our sustainability. We have, all of us have academic connections. Uh, in some form or another. Some of us live in academia, others don't, but, but we're still very strongly connected in one way or another to the academic world. But the academic incentive model is very at odds with, um, with, the, open, with the open collaboration models of open source. There are sources of both technology, we are sources of both technology and even economic value. Right now, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, IBM, all have commercial products based on Jupiter. And we're not exactly getting rich around here. I mean, we're still scrambling for small grants, right? And I'm sure that the combined size of those companies is in the hundreds of billions of dollars, right? And we're scrambling for small amounts of money to pay one employee. Um, and all the pieces of, the pu of this puzzle are being explored in different ways. Grad students and postdocs have a role to play, but we can't expect that to be the life forever uh, of people. Uh, and and, and the, the tenure postdoc is not a viable answer to the career problem. Um, there's a, a research software engineer model that is being explored in the UK, in the Netherlands, and other places. Uh, Tracy uh, uh, alluded to that. The national laboratories in the US do have career paths for scientists working on software, but the labs have their own challenges. Um, as I've said before, the, the relationship with industry is a tricky one. How can we evolve into a healthier relationship with industry? Um, for those who are, of us who are in academia, I have a sta standard kind of tenure track appointment at UC Berkeley, but getting there was really weird, and that's a story for another day. Can we do something that opens that path in a more sensible way than the craziness that, that was, that, that, that was the, the process that I went through? So I want to point you to this, uh, uh, this blog post that at least provides some thinking ideas that I read it recently. It's from Nadia Egbal. She used to be at Google. She's the author of a, probably a study that many of you have read called Roads and Bridges about uh, uh, open, open digital infrastructure. Um, it's inspired by Eleanor Ostrom's work on, uh, called Governing the Commons. And it turns out that Titus was referring to it yesterday. I already had it open in my browser. So whenever you find yourself with something that Titus tells you to read, you're probably onto something. <laughs> um, but there's a number of interesting ideas there about taking a less fatalistic view that this is another tragedy of the commons which is doomed to be destroyed by sort of rapacious extractive interests and that there may be mechanisms that can be engineered to provide sustainability and health uh, from within the communities if we do it sensibly and deliberately and with, uh, with the right thinking. Um, so despite my, my, uh, my slightly snipey comments about industry, I am super grateful to some industry because there are, the folks who are here have actually made this possible. Uh, companies like uh, Bloomberg in particular, Anaconda have given us a huge amount of resources. O'Reilly has made it possible for us to run conferences. Um, these other companies have given us resources. So some of them are genuinely trying to do the right thing, but there is a lot more to do with industry. Um, and I want to stop. I'm pretty much, I'm pretty sure that I am at the end of my clock. Thank you so much.